the religious prayers and the prayers of all the world surrounding me. They were always brother priests. And I was reminded as I invoked the Holy Spirit, were you to become a bishop, as I mentioned before, when his president Bethany decides that the children are old enough and she wants to go to a monastery, then he will uh, be presented, he will be presented even earlier, before the reading of the gospel, because the bishop's duty is to preach and teach and ordain. So he gets to be ordained early, but he will make a bishop to meet the fact. Three bishops. Would he make a priesthood? He can just one bishop only. So, and take this opportunity to point this out because from now on, there will be less fun. You know, all that stuff that we were waiting for the last time, the prayers and all that. No, he's now already a virgin of the church. He's being granted a higher office. He's being trusted with more. And so, Let's join him now as he leads us, directs us to pray for all those things that make for God. Save 
gather to, this, to witness this remarkable work of the Lord, and so many of the clergy have gathered. I wonder, I'm not a church historian of this particular parish, but I wonder if there have ever been as many priests or their guys uh, together for a single service. This was quite impressive. And it speaks to the love of the brothers for this particular brother, Deacon Constantine, and for the church, and for their priest, their minister. And I rejoice in that. Were this a smaller church, I would limited you to maybe 12. But because it's such a small church, and even with as many of us as viewers are in here, there's still room. I rejoice in your presence. I speak now because this is where the bishop speaks. I told you that the bishop is ordained to teach and to ordain. And this is the teaching moment in the church. Sadly, for many of us, we've moved that moment to the end of the liturgy so that we can catch as many people in our net as possible because we've gotten used to coming as late as possible in the service. And the priest doesn't want to leave the ecclesia's mouth unenlightened and unfed. So he aims for the moment when that be the most. But in fact, the liturgy has a, a, a beautiful shape. And in this first part, we're fed on the word of God. We hear the word of God through the words of, of an apostle, generally Paul, but sometimes Peter and sometimes John. And then a passage from the Gospels. And then they're opened up for us by the teacher, be it the bishop or the priest or a designated theologian. And so we feed on the Word. And in a sense, we are replicating the teaching activity of the Jewish community in the synagogue. You know, this is what we would do in synagogue. We would read scripture and then have it open to us, expound it to us. The second half of the liturgy, as it were, or this leads into the liturgy of the gifts, the mystery of the offering of bread and wine, which becomes for us the body and blood of Christ. And in days of old, the first part was open to anyone, really, or to catechumens, people who were learning about the faith, people who were curious, they could hear up to the teaching. But from this point on, it's for the initiated, it's for the baptized. This is a holy moment. And so, I like to preserve that shape of the liturgy. And I want to relieve you of whatever anxiety you may be experiencing. I'm not going to speak again. When the deacon speaks to me, I will let these be my words spoken to him before the time, because I found in the scripture things to talk to him about, about himself and about his ministry. First of all, and pardon me, I'm not checking my mail, but I don't have a perfect memory of the scripture. St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And we heard him say, Beloved, if it seems advisable that I should go, the other brothers will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, or I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may speed me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Speed him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brethren. As for
for our brother Paulus. I strongly urged him to visit with the other brethren, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. What a strange thing to read. You know, it just seems like such a ephemeral bit of stuff from St. Paul's letter. Most of it, you know, St. Paul's letter is filled with rich theology and, and, and specific instructions that apply to the community in Corinth, but still apply to us today. Here we're just reading kind of like BS. You know, I'm going to be coming, hopefully I'll be there, and if I don't, this and this and this. It's like, wow, that just seems so unimportant. And yet, and yet, we hear Paul managing the work of the church, overseeing the movement of his fellow workers. We see, in a sense, what it is that the overseer does. And the overseer in Greek is literally episkopos, overseer, bishop, supervisor. All those things mean the exact same thing, the overseer, the one who coordinates the activity of the church. And that often involves the moving of forces from one place to another. I'm sending my brother in and speed him on his way. He has to go there and he's got to do this and he's got to do that. But Paul says, I can't come to you right away. I'm staying here in Ephesus until Pentecost. Not the Christian Pentecost, or necessarily, but, well, yes, even by this time it would have been the Christian Pentecost. Because the Jews celebrated the Feast of Pentecost too, and it would now become a, 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 a feast of the whole people. But he says, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective work, is what and there are many adversaries. A wide door for effective work is open to me. Paul is always open to that. He's always tasting the, testing the waters. He's always open to the movement of the Spirit to go where work will be most effective. And Paul didn't just stay in one place. As much as people would have loved him to, he kept moving. He knew that wasn't his ministry. His ministry was not to stay in one place. His ministry was to reach as many places as possible before the coming of the Lord. He was in a rush to do God's work. I believe he stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. That's a very long time. And so the Corinthians followed him wherever he was going by sending him letters and asking him to solve their problems. They said, you know, it's not clear what we should do in this instance. What do you say? And so we have a very interesting, we have St. Paul writing to them twice at length in a very intimate tone. Intimate, by intimate, I mean he's not afraid to raise his voice from time to time because he knows them all by name. He's been with them for a year and a half. But they trust him. And here, my point is that I am ordaining somebody here today that has worked with you for four years and who you love very much. But I'm the overseer, and I know where the forces need to be deployed. And I know that I need him because an effective door, a, a door is open for effective ministry elsewhere. And I believe he is the one to do that. And so I am ordaining him among, in your midst, but I'm sending him to another place. And that's how it's always been. You know, people move, people move for the glory of God and his church. But Timothy is coming, you know, others are coming, Apollos is gonna be there. So we hear about comings and goings. You know, I'm taking somebody, but I'm bringing somebody. I've assigned to you now a new lay assistant, Constantine, and I'm sure you will embrace him in the same way that you embrace him. The other constant, the other, and help make of him. It takes a parish to, to make a deacon or a priest. It takes a whole community. So we work together in this. And because we've come to a critical point in the life of Father Themistocles, Father Tom, that he has come to say, I've run the race, I've 
done what I could. It's time for me to set aside the full-time ministry, not the priesthood, just the full-time ministry. It's time for me to take somebody else and bring him to you. And I've got that over there. You met him, haven't you? This is Jerusalem. Father Theodore, the gift of God, the treatise. So I'm bringing from Holy Cross in Stroudsburg, and I'm sending back the man I'm ordained today to Holy Cross in Stroudsburg for making an exchange. So we heard that there, Paul was sensitive. He says, I'm not door has opened for effective ministry, and I hope that you appreciate that soon to be priest. Constantine, that I'm sending you to a place where the door is open. The door is open. You and your, and your dad are going to find a fertile field to gather in the, the fruits of what another has labored to spread your own seed, to raise your own. And we heard today that Jesus, you know, as I said, I, I, I mentioned this seemed to be a random day, and in a sense it is a random day. It's the day that fit in my very full schedule. And I wanted to ordain Deacon Constantine, before I sent him up, I wanted him to have some experience as a priest before he takes over a parish. And because God worked things the way he did, he didn't leave me any other weekends. And so he, I had to pick a day. And this is the day I picked. But it turns out to be the day of the Holy Apostle Thaddeus, who is not among the apostles that comes to mind when we think of the Holy Apostles. You know, he's not one of the say he's not one of the first six or eight that we name. He's probably one of the last couple that comes to mind. Because he's named in various ways in the texts. But we heard about this in the Gospel of Mark. At that time, we're told, Jesus went up to the mountain and called to him those who he called to him those who he desired. You know, this is a selection from a larger group. Jesus is followed by a lot of people by this time in his ministry. Everyone wants to be close to him because of the profundity and the sweetness of his words and because of the power that he exhibited in bringing people, in making people whole, in restoring people to the fullness of health. Who wouldn't want to be close to someone like that? But of this large crowd, Jesus had been with them long enough to discern that some of them had special gifts that he could use for his ministry, for his earthly ministry and beyond. And so we're told that he called him those whom he desired. You know, the gospel doesn't tell us every little thing. There are spaces in it that we have to ponder and think about. And we have to think that Jesus interacted with these men and tested them and knew them. And he appointed out of this crowd 12 to be with him and to be sent out. That's what an apostle is. It's someone who is sent out to do what? To preach and to have authority to cast out demons. So he's empowering and he's entrusting the word to them and he's sending them out. They're going to be close to him and he brings them close to him, but for the purpose of sending them out. And then we have the list. Simon, whom he nicknamed Peter, which means in Greek, rock. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, whom he nicknamed Boanerges, that is, the sons of thunder. We don't know why he gave them that nickname. Did they have loud voices? Did they have short tempers? For some reason, thunder came to mind when he interacted with them, and he called them sons of thunder. Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, 
and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So he brought them all in. And then it says, this is curious, then he went home, and the crowd came together again, so that the apostles, the disciples could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For people were saying, he is beside himself. In other words, he's out of his mind. Mark tells us these things. We don't get this in every gospel, but we get hints that his, his, his family was a little confused by this. You know, just as everybody was confused. I mean, where did he get this stuff? He was just a, a carpenter. He was just a, he didn't go to rabbinical school. He didn't train under any rabbis. And here he is walking around saying, I say to you, I say to you, and doing these remarkable things. And, you know, these are troubled times, and he might get himself noticed by authorities, and he might get in trouble. And let's just pull him back into his normal life again so that nobody is, is scandalized by him. Nobody uh, turns on him. Let's do it to protect him. You know? And it just leaves us there. It doesn't tell us any more than that. But it's interesting that oftentimes, when somebody does come forward to follow the Lord, and especially in this particular way, when someone makes himself available to serve this intimately as co-worker of Christ as a priest, sometimes they meet opposition within their family. In this case, we don't see that. In this case, his parents returned from Greece before the time so that they could be here. And that's wonderful. And they bless this, don't you? They bless this with both hands. Yes, and this is, uh, everyone is behind this. You know? Sometimes, lately, you know, people come into the Orthodox Church and it creates a rift between themselves and the tradition that they left behind. Because they experienced the beauty of Christ and orthodoxy, but their friends and associates and, and family and nearest and dearest don't see that and don't hear that. And they say, stay where you are. Stay here in Catholicism. Or stay here in the Methodist Church. Or stay here. Or stay here. Don't go there. That's a strange and a weird place. And yet they do that. But here, we don't have that drama. We have someone, who, a family that recognizes that Jesus is worth every sacrifice. And they give their son to do whatever it is that Jesus tells them to do. You know, sometimes we make a correspondence. You know, we like to kind of say in the Orthodox Church, you know, this equals this. When the priest comes out, this, is, this symbolizes this. Or this symbolizes that. And I understand the temptation to do that, but the liturgy and the sacramental life and all that isn't really a kind of code that you have to learn. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence that one can... You can't say the bishop represents Christ and the apostles represent... Uh, and the deacon. No. Uh, in the ministry, we all image Christ in a different way. The deacon has been imaging Christ to you in a very real way. Christ the servant. Christ the bridge between the heavenly and the earth and Christ who goes in and out and, and calls you and, 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 and brings the people together, calls the people together and does the will of the bishop who in that context is the father and in one of the earliest analyses or the script discussion of these things by one of the earliest church fathers, St. Ignatius of Antioch he said that the bishop is not the image of Christ, but the image of God himself, of God the Father. And the deacons represent Christ, as I've been saying, and the priests represent the apostles. The apostles who, he says, are like, strung together like strings on a harp, and that the Holy Spirit is the collector. And that when the Holy Spirit strums them through the hand of the bishop, that they lift up a, a chord of praise, a beautiful hymn of praise, because they're all in harmony. And it's the bishop who directs the music through the grace of the Holy Spirit. And they all work together to send up a glorious hymn. And that's what I've got today. I've got, you know, a full orchestra, you know? Surrounded by all sorts of various sounds, 
and the Holy Spirit is working through all of them in their various ministries throughout the area, wherever, wherever they may come. I'm really thrilled that this isn't just a collection of Father's classmates or fellow Greek Orthodox Archdiocese people, that we have people who are here from a variety of jurisdictions, from the OCA, from uh, the Romanians, from um, Antiochians. Uh, I haven't examined the list as closely as all that, but I know that many faces are strange to me. Not that they're not good looking, but they're strange to me. Uh, and, uh, but I'm happy to have them with me. But now, this is a beautiful icon of the church. You know? In days of old, I like to talk about in days of old because sometimes we moved away from practices that were closer to the intention of, of the apostles and the early church. And if this were a church built in the high Episcopal style of the early church, there would be behind the altar like a bank of seats. Like It would look like an amphitheater that you would associate with ancient Greece. And the bishop would sit at the top of that. Now he put his throne over there. And that's unfortunate. His throne belongs up there. And you would see him. And he would have, he would have his army of priests around him. And it would be such a beautiful image of the kingdom. And he would bless one after another to go to the altar to, to, to say prayers until the time had come for him to come to the altar. So there was just a whole other experience. But I, I just experienced that to some degree when I had the altar on my throne and saw so many priests. It was such a beautiful sight. Such a beautiful sight. Well, Deacon, this is what I'd like to tell you. I hope you came something of this, whatever was useful, you take with you to your new assignment, which is, it has to be, all our work for Christ has to involve the cross. You know? It's in your name, the deacon. I mean, you are named after the saint who had a vision of the cross and made enormous changes in his life and in the life of the kingdom to conform to the reality of that cross. But we now know that that's not just an instrument of torture. It's the gateway to salvation. It's the door to all blessedness. So we're not, I'm not sending you to mount a cross to be crucified at Strasbourg. I'm, taking, I'm sending you to lift up the cross and to celebrate the and to experience through the cross in all its depths, its height and its depth and its, and its expanse. So high you can't get over it, so low you can't get under it, so wide you can't get around it. The Holy Cross, you must go in through the door. Well, I'm talked out. You're listening to But we're now going to move from, as I said, the liturgy of the word to the liturgy of the day. We're going to transfer the offerings of bread and wine. And once I've received them and placed them on the holy altar table, then the, act, the offering of the deacon will take place. Whereas in his first ordination, two deacons brought him forward. In this instance, two priests will bring him forward. And they will ask me to summon him. Because as much as he is willing to do this, it's still the bishop's call. I have to say, I need you. This is the time. So you'll hear the command. Give the command. Give the command, Master. And I will signal that I'm ready. He'll come forward. I'll bless him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I'll give him an opportunity to tell me what brings him here. And then he will remember everything I just said, and 
and then I will take him into the altar as I did for his first ordination, around the holy table, and he'll kiss the corners of that table that he will serve, on which he will set the holy offerings in the days to come, three times, and we will hear some hymns that we associate not only with the ordination, but with the wedding service, because he is marrying himself to the church in a real way. And then I ask him to kneel to my right hand, and you'll hear the prayers of ordination, and then you'll be vested on you, but with a continuity. I'm not going to completely revest him, but I'm going to add to his vestiture, or take elements of his vestiture and make them something else. The distinguishing vestment that sets a deacon apart, that piece that's called the orati, the belt that's draped in a particular way that he holds up when he calls people to prayer, will become, in a sense, recreated to form the petrachil, the piece that distinguishes the priest that hangs down from the neck, and that without which a priest can't do a service, that symbolizes the grace that pours from our eye, the Holy Spirit, that streams down at his prayers. And when I rested him, and I'll present him to you, then, and everyone proclaims that he is worthy, and he is greeted by the brotherhood, then he will stand at my right hand. You know, we're not in a random order here around the table. We're in order of ordination. The senior priest in a gathering is the one who has served the longest. It doesn't matter how old he is. It, and, you know, the youngest priest may be, in fact, older than any of the priests. But if he's only been just ordained, he's still the youngest priest. But we are in the series, we have an order here. And it's the oldest priest, and then the next oldest, and then the next, and then the next, and then the If this were a normal liturgy, and from any liturgy forthcoming until I ordain another priest, Father Constantine will be at the end of the line. But because today is a special day, he moves to my right hand. He's my first priest for the rest of the service. And the other priests move around to accommodate. And there is one special moment that will yes. the thing that distinguishes this ordination from the other is that when the time comes for once the, the bread has been consecrated. And, and becomes the body of Christ, I entrust it to him. I put it in his own hands. And I tell him that this will be required of him at the judgment day, that he is to watch over, he is to protect this, and to see that it is only given to those who are prepared to receive it. And then he's sent to the other side of the altar table to pray and to be in the fullness of the presence of the body of Christ. And then when it comes time for me to unite it with the blood of the chalice, he'll, be, he'll bring it forward. And I just want you to be careful about that, uh, Father Dino. Uh, Bishop Maximus, my predecessor, uh, long told the story of the priest to whom he had committed this uh, amno. And then when the time came for him to give it back, his hands were empty. He thought he had given it to eat, and there was nothing to liturgize with. So be forewarned not to do that. So, with that, my beloved, let's move on to the liturgy of the gifts and uh, to the moment when the deacon is offered to become a priest of the Lord. Blessed are we ever by your might, we make your glory to you. Father, Son, Holy 
spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages.
during the suddenly divine liturgy as we approach in a short while that great mystery of the ordination to the priesthood. As your deacon, I am encouraged by your blessing, your prayers, and as I seek to continue not to be served, but to serve. As a priest in Christ's holy church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, your God's church, that embraces the whole world, having been spread and strengthened by the prayers, works, and teachings of the apostles, like the apostle Thaddeus and the seventy apostles, whom we celebrate today. As St. Paul tells us in his epistle to the Hebrews, referring to the priesthood, one does not take the honor of himself, for he is called by God, just as Aaron was. The priesthood is Christ. The priesthood belongs to him. The priesthood is about him. All things in the priesthood are done through him who is the true God, the Messiah, the Savior, and life of the world, the resurrection, the bread of life, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the bridegroom of the church. Having said that, no one is worthy of the priesthood. As the best priest ever, and by far, is Christ himself, the great high priest who was crucified and risen for our salvation. Yet, his divine grace, and revealing that which is infirm and completing that which is lacking, makes what is impossible for man possible for God, and then do become priests becoming vessels of grace, by the grace of the all Holy Spirit, for the advancement of the kingdom of heaven and the work of Christ on earth, continuing the work of the apostles. As St. Cosmas Epilos, special to the region of Ikeros in Greece, from where I have roots, to remind the Greek people under the Turkish joke the entire world would beseech God that cannot perform the holy sacraments. But a priest, even a sinner, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, can perform the holy sacraments. St. Cosmos refers to priests as even higher than angels and kings, because the priest invokes the grace of the Holy Spirit for the bread and the wine of the liturgy to become the very body, precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ which is something that even the angels can do. Approaching the great calling of the priesthood, I stand with awe and fear. If the holy apostle Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, then what can I say about my own self? Who am I before the Lord? St. Cosmas reminds us to do that the priest might sacrifice himself to the blood of Christ. He reminds us that the priest must remember his responsibility for the souls under his care, as the tassels on his, on his soul, the tetrachini, represents those souls. And as you will remind me shortly, I will have to give an account before Christ for the sacred deposit that you will entrust me. Like the prophet Isaiah, I feel the words within me, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. Giants of the faith stand before me, who have become perfected in the life of Christ. <clears throat> Wonderful courage you have given. Sweat, tears, and even blood for Christ and his holy church. I am reminded of saints like the saint, simple Saint Nicholas of Anas of the 20th century. Whose glory was his priestly garment, his priestly lasso, who was not wise in the eyes of the world that is fleeting and superficial, but was wise in the eyes of those who saw Christ, who thirsted for something deeper, who saw in him the image of Christ, a saintly priest who has two more hands for the Lord to work in this dark and troubled world of ours. Looked down upon by those who thought more highly of themselves, he was the one ultimately being visited by saints, even in this side of life, and was serving with angels during the divine virtue. Your eminence, with your blessing, 
I approach the hardest as a laborer. I am following in obedience and leaning on the encouragement of my spiritual father, Father Nicarios Kodos, who has reminded me about St. Nicholas Palas, who is not able to physically be here today. I am leaning on the support and love of the clergy, parents, siblings, grandparents, nephews, nieces, cousins, aunts, and uncles, proud family, and friends. I am grateful for all these people. I am grateful for all those who have come near and far to be with us today. I am grateful to the parishioners of St. Constantine and Helen, who together with Father Thomas Papalis and Deacon Jim Helleker have seen me grow over these past four years, being with us in milestones in my own life. Engaged, married, ordained the deacon, and now today is to be ordained the priest. I am grateful that I was ordained the deacon, and in being ordained the priest of the Church of my patron saint, Saint Constantine, and his mother, Saint Helen. I am grateful to be sent by this parish, like an apostle in a sense, onto the next mission, for the good of the gospel and Christ's holy church having been prepared here for the next chapter of my life. As you reminded me, friends, there is something to be said about having served at the parish of St. Constantine and Helen, and then going to the parish of Holy Cross in Strasbourg, as St. Constantine and Helen are closely and deeply associated with the cross of the Lord and with the feast day of the cross. I am grateful to parishioners of both communities that have come here today to be here for the Alphonsa Agriviani. I am grateful to be ordained on the feast of an apostle, which reminds me again of the apostolic roots of our church. I am grateful for the prayers and examples of our saints, the prayers of St. Paisios the Aconite, St. Ephemia, St. Senna, St. Petersburg, who have been sources of encouragement in our spiritual lives for my wife and me during this time of preparation. Most especially, I am grateful for the love and intercessions of our most holy Theotokos, our most dear Gunner Theotokos, whose permission we continue celebrating today. The Panagia has been a source of hope in our lives, keeping us close to Christ. My wife and I are trying to trust and rely on staying close to the Panagia in order to bring ourselves within the arms and embrace of our Lord and our Son, in order to stay on the right path and not be led astray, in order to not jeopardize our own souls. Holy Mountain for Holy Protection. I am grateful for the blessing of having Panagia's Holy Protection Monastery nearby, during my assignment to Holy Cross in Strasbourg. I also would like to mention that I am grateful in hearing in the epistle reading today Macedonia mentioned, as it brings to my mind my ordination to the diaconate, being ordained on the feast of St. Nestor, the after feast of St. Demetrius the Great Martyr, one of my most favorite saints. Macedonia and the rest of my Hellenic heritage have a special place in my heart and in my life. But they serve as a reminder for me that the treasure, the source and blessing of everything good and beautiful and noble and true within my heritage is Christ and His Church. As my childhood parish priest of blessed memory, Father Demetrius of the East, who repose this past Saturday with the constant to say, This work without faith is what we have to offer to America. It is not just only for those of my ethnic heritage, but for the whole world, as my brother clergy here today are a testimony to that reality. Last but not least, going forward for this awesome responsibility of the priesthood, I am grateful to have by my side my dear and precious wife, the Alonsa of Algeria. I cannot thank her parents enough for raising her. I 
know we have had some challenging times, but everything is going to be okay. As we will have the Pandemia to keep us close to Christ, and we will have the protection of the Holy Cross. I thank you, Your Eminence, and I thank my wife from the bottom of my heart for staying by my side. I thank my wife for supporting and loving me, being the best wife that she can be. That is all I can ask from her. And that is all I continue to ask from her. Being the best wife she can be. And I just want her to know that she's been doing great. Oh, 
mindful of your goodness. For blessed is all our lives, your holy and majestic name, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Axios! Axios! Oh, no. 
μαγιστή το σώμα, το υπέρημα ακόμα This is my body, which is broken for you, for the remission of sins.
who knows that the peace of God can be found. Receive this statement, deposit it, and preserve it until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, at which time he will demand it. I'm going to 